And <clears throat> now we'll kick off with our development updates. We have two presenters today, both talking about stable HLO. Um, and first up, we have a presentation from ARM. Um, Eric is here to chat with us about stable HLO and TOSA. Welcome, Eric. Thanks. All right, let's go on. Uh, I think we can just start from the first slide. Yeah, so, so this, this is based on an RFC that I raised with the stable HLO, HLO repository. There's a pull request with the full details. Uh, we should probably, I assume we'll get a link to that into the, the uh, minutes from this meeting so that uh, anyone who wants to can go uh, re read the full details. This is to kind of give you the introduction and, and core concept and, and start the discussions around that RFC to get those comments flowing and find out uh, what the community thinks of this and, and how we can uh, unlock the value of, of aligning both stable HL and TOSA uh, arithmetic. Uh, next slide. So here's a very brief uh, introduction or comment on what uh, TOSA is. Uh, for, for further details, I've got a link to the uh, main TOSA page here. So this is just a, a very brief uh, introduction. TOSA is a, a set of whole tensor operations that are commonly used by neural networks. Um, and, and the main emphasis we've had on it, we want it to be implementable across a wide range with, with kind of an emphasis on accelerators with fixed function hardware. So we have some, ARM has some examples of uh, fixed function accelerator out there for microcontrollers, the Ethos U55. Those are kind of some, to give people some sense of, of what kind of hardware that might, might be. And that mainly includes um, systems where you can't afford a floating point multiplier. Multi floating point multipliers are in those systems are are too expensive. Microcontrollers can't afford the area or power to have floating point and the fixed function accelerators save a, a, a significant amount of power by keeping everything purely integer. And with the integer operations, TOSA in our, in our um, kind of testing and, and conformance setup, TOSA requires you to be a uh, bit accurate. So if, we have, we have a conformance test suite that you can run and on integer ops, you need to be a bit accurate to ensure kind of repeatability and portability across implementations. Uh, and like I said, for more details on, on TOSA, that's the website's right there. There's a link in the, in the slide itself. Um, feel free to go there. There's a discussion forum linked off there where you're welcome to ask questions. We also look at um, Discord and the MLIR discourse for any other um, TOSA, TOSA comments or questions. Okay, next slide. So, and then to give a little bit more background, I imagine most people on this call probably already know this, but I, I, I don't want to jump in, but without any explanation. Um, and so, so one of the main things we're concerned about with TOSA is, is quantization and quantized networks. So quantization uses a, a smaller integer type to represent the floating point values in the network. And, and there's an example there from um, just a, a, a simple tensor that is uniformly quantized where you have eight, an eight bit integer representing the 32 bit float. There's a scale of, of two and a zero point of, of one. And then with quantized networks, um, you then get into the co concept of uh, integer or fully quantized networks. So it's possible to have a mixed quantized floating point network. But um, one of the areas in, for discussion here is, is fully quantized networks where everything in the entire network has been replaced with integer-based operation. Often that's due to you know, wanting to deploy on, on something fairly uh, small or very as low power as possible. Um, integer operations are 
pretty much always um, lower power and, and area that's significant in the mobile and in the embedded and others also, you know, power is always a, a factor for, for everyone, I think. Um, but also in these networks, all operations are integer and with integer kind of, as I mentioned before, you can guarantee that you can reproduce the same results across implementations. And that's, it's impossible to guarantee with floating point uh, networks, you're, you're, any slight variance in, in implementation is likely to have some bit drift. Okay, next, next slide, please. So, so one of the, the, the biggest way that TOSA uh, differs from, from most other uh, quantized implementations out there is how we do the precision scaling. And I've got a link to the portion of the specification that focuses on precision scaling. But the way we do precision scaling is um, we, we move all of the quantization into this explicit rescale operation where, uh, as described here, the result is the value, the incoming value multiplied by an integer multiplier, you add a round, and then you do a right shift. All, all, each of those steps is integer. So at every point in time, you can guarantee uh, exact behavior. And you have options for the multiplier and the, the shift that allows for us to match different frameworks. So you could, if, if there's um, say TensorFlow Lite has one version of uh, quantization and how they operate and PyTorch or, or Onyx or, or something else has a different uh, implementation, you should be able to get replicate their behavior on quantized networks by adjusting them to how you calculate the multiplier and shift for a given um, for a given framework. And those shift and value ranges are limited. We, there's some rules and details in the scaling document on um, shift, for example, is between two and 62. Um, and those allow a variety of implementations to, um, to be considered when you're doing it, whether it's a, a, if you're implementing it straight in hardware or if you have a, uh, a multi-step process for software. Okay, next slide. Oops, we hopped one there. Can we go back one? I think we skipped one. One second. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh oh, now we're really. <laughs> All right, let me start. Sorry off. about that. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, are we here? Yeah, 14. 14. Yeah, the next one. Okay, so this is this is just a uh, explicit example of something like quantize addition. So quantize addition, um, generally in the framework, you'll you'll be adding two numbers, and they might have in this example they have different scale factors. Uh, one is 0 0.025, one is 0 0.075, and then the output has yet a different scale factor of 0.15. So uh, a lot of times what happens in the framework is, is hidden. This is, you don't know exactly how the add is, is taking place. So what happens in TOSA is we would, we break this um, addition out. And so we, we scale each input. So we, you can see a TOSA rescale of the first input with a given multiplier and shift. You can see um, the second input being scaled with a, it's, it's, specific multiplier and shift. And that brings those into a uh, common domain so that you can actually do the addition. At that point, you have essentially unquantized, just plain 32-bit integers that you, can, um, that you can add together without worrying about scale effect, scale problems uh, or zero points. Um, we do allow, 
we do incorporate zero point in the rescale. It's a common enough feature in quantized networks that um, it, it seems important. Uh, that happens outside of the um, multiply shift. That happens before you to the value before you apply the multiplier and shift. So then once we've done the addition, we then just res apply the same concept to rescale back from um, the 32-bit value to the 8-bit value. And then you would go on in the um, in, in the process. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here, here, so so that was a lot of background. So what is what is it we're actually proposing here? What we're what we're suggesting is um, that we align the stable HLO quantized operations to be implementable with TOS operations, and what that gives us, what that gives hopefully everybody in the community, is the ability to run stable HLO models on TOSA compliant hardware with bit accurately defined behavior. So what does, that, what does that involve? That primarily means adding a rescale <clears throat> operation that effect, it, it is effectively very similar to the um, TOS operator. And then you can remove the floating, you know, we, we, you, you go through the same process to remove the floating point from a network, make the operation of uh, anything that is uh, quantized, um, you move that into these explicit operators instead of it being implicit. And then this is a bit, you, you can do it, you don't necessarily have to add a pass that removes the quantization parameters because once you've moved them into um, the explicit op, you don't necessarily uh, need them again. It's not required um, if not, you'll get uh, 8-bit integers that, that look quantized, but you would know you needed to not act on them quantized. So I think that's a little uh, confusing. So, so my suggestion would be to, to remove the quantization parameters at that point. And also the, the current stable HLO spec um, doesn't, is, I don't think is explicit about what happens when you've got quantized tensors. So it would be good to get that uh, written down. I, I, I think there's probably um, some some relatively known what stable HLO does here, but maybe just it's probably just hasn't made it into the specification yet. Um, one more slide, I think. Right. So it, it, again, in the RFC, I kind of poke these up as, as things that should be addressed in the future. They're not addressed in this RFC, 8-bit um, floating point. We don't have 8-bit floating point in TOSI yet. Uh, I know that Stable HLO added it, uh, I think two months ago. I, recently, I remember the, the RFC for FP8 support going in. Uh, I think that would be a good area where we can align behavior. Uh, I don't think it's likely we're gonna have um, huge differences. Um, so it, it may just, it's probably a matter of, of fine tuning. Um, as mentioned in the FP8 RFC, dynamic quantization scaling is something I don't think too many people have, like is, is not kind of a widely solved problem yet. Be another area where it'd be good to um, uh, align. And then the last one is some work that um, we've been doing recently about uh, defining the allowable errors for floating point compound operators. So it, in, it hasn't made it to a release. We'll be releasing a new draft of TOSA this month, but um, it's, in the, it's been checked in and into the specification. In the new draft, we describe a way to calculate uh, allowable error for compound floating point operations such as convolution. There's, it's turned out to be a fairly uh, challenging way to come up with a uh, useful bound on floating point 
you know, if you're adding a, a big sequence of um, a floating point, you know, during during a convolution, if you're doing a, a bunch of adds and your rounding starts, if you look at the maximum rounding error, it it rapidly outgrows your your number. So we've come up with a, a description uh, in the TOSA spec. It's probably too detailed to go into right here, um, but we'd love to get people's feedback on how that uh, how that looks and whether um, our our proposed plan is. Um, interesting because that's something that again it'd be good to get wider than just TOSA to kind of think about what what should the solution there be and that is a um, very quick hopefully that was a reasonable overview of what we're proposing um, you can see there's one question in the chat um, let me just hop to that one. Uh, it says, does TOSA support per channel quantization also? Uh, yes, we do support per channel quantization in, in, in TOSA. You can provide um, values per, per channel. Yeah, that's, that's it. Any other questions? And feel free to reach out uh, email or um, on the RFC would probably be the, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it to maybe Thea and Eugene on, on the best methods for um, feedback, but the RFC would be a good place to get comments. Thank and you, it's Eric. visible to everyone. Thank you. Um, I also uh, I wanted to comment on two things. Uh, sure. One of them is uh, kind of the current state of quantization and stable issue, uh, since uh, this is something that uh, that you mentioned uh, as you know as something have an unclear status so happy to elaborate uh, and also on the next steps for the RSC. Um, so first of all uh, you know stable issue low spec uh, as, as you mentioned it doesn't uh, talk about quantization at all at the moment uh, <laughs> but the stable issue dialect itself it does support quant uniform types uh, from the quant dialect the Molière upstream. So uh, that is you know, the current incomplete situation, uh, we inherited the uh, quant uniform support from MHLO when we forked it. MHLO itself inherited it from, you know, was inspired by the work on uh, TF Lite. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we never got to, to spec in this. And this RFC is uh, very timely because uh, recently we decided to dedicate some time, uh, you know, this quarter in putting this together. So that's uh, very, very nice uh, that we can have those discussions uh, in the community. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, speaking of the next steps uh, for the RFC, and it'll be similar uh, to the sparsity RFC that uh, we'll be discussing in just a moment. Uh, at the moment, we haven't yet bootstrapped uh, the uh, recently accepted OpenXLA governance. Uh, and so as a result, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll need to play it by ear. Uh, so what I encourage everyone to do is to comment on the GitHub pull request. So uh, let's have this as our process now, uh, because this is like a public venue available to everyone, easy to comment. Uh, so let's go for it. And uh, depending on the uh, ongoing discussion, uh, we may also want uh, to have some uh, follow-up uh, community meeting focused just on quantization. If there's like a, 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 a lot of discussion, uh, some open questions might be easier to resolve them uh, like in a high bandwidth uh, setting. Uh, Thea, I wonder uh, how much time do we still have left uh, allocated for quantization? Because I had one question, but can defer it until pull request if we don't have time. <clears throat> I think we have 35 minutes left in the meeting. And Art, um, do you have a sense of how long your presentation was going to be? My presentation is very short. So there, uh, go ahead, Eugene, I would say. OK, uh, sounds great. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, in, in one of the slides, Eric, you, you mentioned the lowering from, you know, NML framework representation, which uses, uh, you know, quant uniform types uh, to TOSA. And uh, if I recall correctly, there are lowerings for like, uh, you know, several frameworks, uh, for example, for, for TensorFlow, for TF Lite, 
I know for sure TF Lite uses those quant uniform types. Uh, mm -hmm. Not sure about TensorFlow. Uh, can you talk about your experience with, uh, you know, basically numerical accuracy? Uh, have you observed, you know, some um, maybe some differences between like the original program uh, and uh, you know the the result? And if yes, uh, and the result like in TOSA, I mean, and in TOSA interpreter. And if yes, how big those uh, those differences were? Uh, yeah, we, that's a good question. We've we've gone through, and, and one of the things you know, as we've been adding uh, with with TF Lite legalizations to TOSA, we have on occasion run into inaccuracies. You know, where um, you know we're, we're uh, generally it's it's a bit or two off. Um, so what we've done in those cases, we've looked. Um, generally, it's not been with the legalizations or, or, or there's just a difference in what what the behavior is and we either have updated the legalization to match you know we, we've just often it's just a bug in the legalization or we haven't didn't quite realize what the the tensorflow light behavior was there's been a couple instances where i think we've asked the tensorflow light team to kind of you know if, if there's something we think is you know would be better defined in, um, you know, by changing the behavior based on, on, not necessarily based on TOSA, but just it would it would involve being a, a better behaved um, implementation of the operation. Then we ask for those changes also. Uh, but generally, we just we we have been able to match almost every TensorFlow Lite. Um, Operator behavior, and we have a test suite that runs runs the runs through both paths: the TOSA reference model and the um, uh, and, and the TensorFlow Lite runtime compares the and compares the outputs. And we use that. We're not at a hundred percent passing yet, but we're we're nearing there. Um, looks like they just stop me if if we're. Did, did I answer your question, Eugene? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a lot of valuable information. Uh, and I see that, uh, you know, Jacques in chat mentioned TFI accuracy requirements. Uh, thank you, Jacques. Um, Stella, yeah. I see you have your hand raised. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't have video on. I'm in the process of getting to work. Um, so, yeah, I think that this, uh, this RFC highlights a, a good distinction in the quantization discussions. A lot of... Um, a lot of the quantization discussions that I see tend to focus on how to how to encode metadata that uh, that basically describes how floating point types are quantized, whereas this is um, this is defining the endpoint of a lowering for eliminating such metadata, you know, and actually actually running on on pure um, you know with pure integer arithmetic. Uh, so you know when we do do get a, a real quantization discussion. I think that there are three three stages to that. One is how you how you represent the um, the the floating point quantization metadata that the frameworks like to see in terms of how their tensors are are quantized in a simulated integer environment. Then there's the process for how you lower that to a real um, um, you know a, a pure integer offset, um, which is what in the TF Light Tosa case or the PyTorch Tosa case, ARV has done um, in actual lowerings from TF Light dialect, et cetera. And then there's the what what an opset like stable HLO needs in order to represent the right granularity of ops so that sure. you, you can do that arithmetic. And um, I, ideally, we 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 solve for all all three of those in in a way that is good for the community. But it's kind of the ground truth that Eric is talking about here that we really need to nail down and not. And then, and then not change. The rest of it is just software. There can be multiple implementations, et cetera. Yeah, that's, I think you're exactly right there. Thank you, Stella. Uh, totally agreed that uh, yeah. this has a really high importance. Uh, we uh, put a lot of effort in uh, uh, writing up detailed semantics of uh, stable issue ops, and we got to do the same for quantization, uh, since you know, uh, stable issue needs to support quantization for its users. Thank you. Yeah. 
I see one more question in the chat and we all just address that. Does the proposal also require XLA to be able to understand the TOSA arithmetic dialect? No, I don't, I, I don't think that that would be required by this proposal. I, I, uh, the, really it would just be this one, that one change to add the ability to insert these scales in. Otherwise it can be free to not, it, it wouldn't have to understand that. You would either have a legalization from stable HLO to TOSA or, or something along those lines. That, that piece would eventually, you know, obviously need to understand both. But in general, I don't think that's true. So, but you would, so in, in the intent here is to be able to do one to one translation between the two, right? Or almost one to one. Uh, yeah, I mean, with for for these quantized networks, yeah, for the quantized, um, yeah, that, yeah, that's a plus, yeah, yeah. As Stella said, at the at the at that lowest level, um, mm -hmm. at, at that last point where you're headed towards hardware, right? Okay. So I think that's the intent, uh, not not necessarily anything. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks so much for your presentation, Eric. Sure, yeah. thank you. Thanks everyone for your time. <laughs> thank you. All right, and uh, I'd like to encourage uh, uh, once again everyone to uh, post their comments on GitHub, and uh, you know, if someone wasn't able to attend, and uh, if you view this video. Uh, recording please comment uh we're really looking forward uh, to having this conversation quantization is an extremely important topic uh for the community thank you awesome thank you um okay so our next talk um is on a new sparsity rfc um from art art do you want to uh do you want to take over yes yeah, sure thank you for you um so my presentation is very deliberately, very short. So I'm just going to touch on like the uh, the high points of this RFC, and then hopefully we can have more discussion in the RFC itself. And um, I'm just going to touch on the sort of the pain points where we want to have some discussion and uh, uh, leave like the the deeper details for for the RFC itself. Um, but this RFC is based on the fact that we're seeing more and more that sparse tensor algebra is becoming um, rather uh, widespread in, in the whole ML area. So it's probably a good time to, to start uh, formalizing and uh, uh, defining this a little bit more uh, precise. Um, I think we have a great opportunity here because a lot of people have different ideas how to treat sparsity, but stable HLO is really the right vehicle to create a very healthy ecosystem for sparsity where like ml models no matter what they're written in map to a certain ir that has sparsity incorporated and then backends can do with the sparsity information whatever they want but if we as a community can agree on the on on the specification of sparsity at least in this stable hlo ir then uh, a, a lot of uh like we avoid wasting efforts where everyone writes their own front ends, their own back ends. Uh, uh, so there's a really a, a good opportunity here. So hence this RFC and you can see the link here. Um, and rather than going into like defining how we deal with this sparsity, because like I said, a lot of people have different ideas about it. We just propose adding sparsity to the stable HLO uh, specification. Um, by means of sparse tensor types that combine with the uh, operations of uh, of the stable HLO uh, uh, intermediate. So, uh, if you can go to the next slide, first a little bit like the philosophy. This uh, RFC is based on the uh, the idea that sparsity should should not be something that um, like everyone deals with explicitly. Uh, but it should really be just a type of the tensors. So not a, an implementation detail, but just like people writing models just know that the tensor is sparse and they don't want to deal with low, oh, I have to only skip over the non-zeros with very complex data structures. I just want to tell uh, the compiler that it is uh, sparse and then let the compiler handle 
uh, with the sparsity. And we call such a compiler that is sparsity uh, capable, a sparse compiler. And there are several projects that have explored this idea. I gave several links here. So the MT1 compiler was the first to do this in a Fortran uh, context for linear algebra. And uh, uh, MIT and Stanford uh, uh, team has formalized this to sparse tensor algebra. So higher dimension matrices in the TACO project. And a lot of the ideas in this RFC are based on the TACO formalism. Uh, we have incorporated this already in MLAR compiler infrastructure, and you see two links there so that you can get a little bit background on um, what sparse compilers can do. But in a way, the sparse compilation itself is not part of this RFC. It's really just the uh, specification of sparsity that we want to formalize in stable HLO. Um, but this slide is a little bit for background if you're interested in, in how you can deal with the sparsity. So next slide, please. So this RFC specifically only uh, focuses on two concepts. Uh, we want to introduce sparsity to the tensor types. So tensor types in the dense sense are already part of stable H flow and are rather central there. And we just like the quantization in the previous talk, we propose to add sparsity to that tensor type as an additional encoding or uh, property, something like that. And I'll show an example of that in the next slide. But, and we also um, want to define what stable O H operations can actually support those sparse tensor types. And we have a little bit of ideas. There's a whole spectrum of possibilities there that I'll, I'll, I'll sketch in, in two slides. But uh, uh, the two concepts central uh, are centralized around sparse tensor types and operations that can handle those sparse tensor types. So the next slide, please. So this uh, shows you an example of how a sparse tensor type can look. So you see here a 10 by 10 uh, uh, single position floating point tensor, just like you would use in the dense or the non-sparse world. But then we can add a annotation if you want to this tensor type to make it sparse. And we have a proposal here that is based on the taco formalism, uh, but a little bit more generalized, uh, where we define like a compressed uh, uh, row-wise storage by saying, uh, uh, by defining the mapping and defining what dimension is dense and what dimension is compressed. So here you see that IJ maps to an I that is dense. So the, the, the rows will, uh, uh, be stored in their completeness, but then the J, the columns are compressed. So you'll have per row, you'll have indices in the, the columns saying where the, the non-zeros are stored. But the <laughs> annotation is very general. So we'll have a mapping on the left-hand side, which we call dimension. They correspond to the, the dimension of the tensor. So if you have a matrix, there will be two in this case. If you have a three-dimensional tensor, you'll have I, J, K. Four-dimensional, you have four variables. And then on the right-hand side, we call those levels. You can actually have a different number there. So if you have the same number, it's sort of a one-to-one -one mapping, but you could have less uh, levels there, or you could have, have more levels there. And um, this formalism is very powerful in defining a very wide variety of sparse uh, tensor uh, storage schemes. So things like CSR and doubly compressed CSR, CSC along the columns, DCSC are very trivial, but you can also define block sparsity. You can define ELL, so the it pack, uh, uh, jack di uh, diagonal storage. Um, so we think with this formalism, uh, we'll have enough flexibility that uh, uh, we can represent an enormous amount of uh, sparse tensor uh, storage schemes. Uh, of course, the, the exact syntax is still a little bit open for debate, so that's what we're going to propose in this RFC. And uh, Ren Romano is uh, uh, working full time on coming up with a very uh, elegant syntax for uh, for this. So there's already a syntax in MLAR, um, which is um, right now only dense and compressed, but we have uh, extended this to like singleton properties and a lot of other things. 
And we think it's time here to come up with an even more elegant uh, syntax because we have a few ambiguities that we avoid. For example, in the current MLAR one, we had a mapping um, that was an affine map. So you could define the permutation IJ, J, I, and then individually we would say whether it's dense and compressed. But that would be a little bit ambiguous because you didn't really know whether you apply to dense compress before or after the permutation. And of course, you can define that. But with this new syntax, we actually completely avoid the ambiguity. Um, so this RFC proposes uh, a few examples, but there will be um, a second RFC which will very precisely define the sparse tensor types. Uh, and of course, this initial RFC is uh, the vehicle to get like the debate going so that uh, we know a little bit if people like this new syntax or whether they want to have uh, uh, other components there. There are more examples in the, the RFC, uh, the, the current one, and there will be even more precise specification in the follow-up RFC that RAN will post. So those are the sparse tensor types. So let, let's go to the operations in the next slide. So um, the idea is that uh, all the operations in the stable HLO uh, specification can be made sparse by simply defining one or two operands and even the output as sparse. And this has the advantage that you avoid like the enormous explosion of operations that you would need if you would specify sparsity in the operation as well. So let's take an, uh, an example. Suppose you would add two tensors. This is like the most simple example you can come up with. So you have stable H low dot add. So element wise addition two matrices. Suppose you wanted to uh, incorporate sparsity in the operation, then you would have like a stable H low add for the dense case, and you would have like a an add left hand side sparse, right hand side dense for one case. Uh, uh, the result may be sparse, both operands may be sparse. So you will have like a lot of add operations for different uh, sparsity patterns, and then also for different storage schemes. So you would have a version for adding like a column wise to a row wise, uh, two column wise, etc. So that really goes out of hand rather quickly. But by, uh, as this proposal says, by just uh, using the same operation, but only uh, changing the types, you really avoid this uh, explosion of, of, of possibilities. So we propose to just annotate the tensors as being sparse. So the first example is just dense dense, the one that is already in stable it's low and uh, that just works as expected. But then the next one says that oh, the right hand side, so matrix two, is now in CSR uh, format, and uh, uh, we add it to a dense one, and the result is a dense one. And the uh, third one, third example shows you a case where we add two sparse tensors, and the result is also a sparse tensor. So the output type defines also that there is sparsity. And here you already get a little bit of a feeling um, uh, what the next problem is I'm going to discuss, namely what would be the result? Do we want the compiler to infer this or do we want the programmer to specify this or, or the program in this sense, like the person generating the, the IR? Because if you would add two sparse tensors, you don't necessarily, you could come up with heuristics saying, oh, adding two sparse, remain but that's not always the case so in the next slide okay yeah thank you um we have a little bit of considerations that we want to uh, uh discuss uh for the operation support uh, the first one is do we want all operations to accept sparse tensor types and we call that sort of an open world one or do we want only a restricted set of operations to accept sparse tensor types? And we call it a closed one. So we're leaning a little bit towards the closed world. So we start with a subset of operations where we can specify what sparsity means very precisely in the, in the spec. Uh, we're open for a debate uh, uh, on the open world one, but... Um, like previous experience with like uh, MHLO and, and sparsity shows that we probably wanna 
uh, not go overboard in uh, uh, like letting every operand execute because uh, it's not always clear what you uh, have to do there. So I think starting with the restricted set and sp specifying the semantics very precisely is probably the right approach. But again, this is like part of the debate in RFC. And then the second problem is uh, what I was alluding to in the previous slide. Um, like, do we want a type inference system where the compiler automatically given like the input operands uh, computes the output operand sparsity type? Or do we just want to explicitly define that? And again, here, um, we're leaning towards uh, having um, uh, an explicit builder for that AR because there are no heuristics that like capture all cases. Like sometimes you add two sparse tensors and the model writer er, knows that the output will be dense, even though the two inputs are sparse. Um, and sometimes the output will be sparse. So you relying on inference rules, although doable is, is not always the right approach. So in this initial IR, we just assume that there is some, um, like, whatever the input is that generates the stable HLO with sparsity has some knowledge on what rules to use and stable HLO as a spec simply provides this mechanism for building that IR. And it doesn't try to be too smart in like also including the inference rules. So um, like I said, we're leaning towards a closed world model, a restricted set of stable HLO operations and uh, explicit builders in, instead of inference of sparsity but again this is open for debate and uh, we would of course love to hear from you uh, again lots of people have different opinions on how sparsity should be done and uh, we look forward to, to having that discussion so next slide for some concluding work so uh, i went really fast over everything i just wanted to touch the important parts and i i want to leave the rest of the discussion uh, for the, the RFC itself. So hopefully it speaks for itself. You, again, here's the link. And um, we're looking forward to uh, like a lively debate on like Eugene said on GitHub probably as, as the right place to do that. So happy to take questions if there are any. I think there is um, <clears throat> a question from Vinod on chat. Um, so in this RFC, any operator defined for dense tensor is defined for a sparse annotated tensor type as well. So yeah, or the, the, that's the open world versus closed world I was talking about. So the open world would allow that. So any stable HL operator would just accept sparsity. Uh, we think that is a very ambitious, but probably too ambitious approach. So we're proposing a closed world one. And in the RFC, we actually give a subset of the operations where sparsity makes a direct sense and can be pretty well defined. And uh, we're leaning towards this closed world model because you can, especially certain like uh, very um, reshaping operations, like uh, sparsity doesn't directly make sense there. So we, we, we would prefer to have this restricted set of operations that we can specify. But again, we're open for debate if you feel like all like, operations should accept. So I think that uh, it probably should. Well, so I think it sounds like the rationale for this needs to be maybe stated somewhere. So one rationale could be it makes stable HLO simpler, right, uh, and easy to implement. Another rationale could be it makes the user programs uh, more natural, right. And and if uh, you have a design that basically addresses both, that's that's the best way to do it. I, I don't have. I mean, I can see. Advantages of doing what you call open world, where you, you just say annotate some data. Uh, this is going to be sparse, and this is going to be sparse, and and the uh, and the system figures out everything without any changes to the IR or or maybe just generate code differently, right? Yes, so that the, could be the, yeah, an approach. A, yeah, that's a very good observation. So. The open world would correspond to you can accept any NumPy program, for example, with right. sparsity on the arrays. And so that makes it simpler on the user side, although it always works. Mm -hmm. uh, the closed world corresponds more to the approach uh, JAX has been taken, where there's like a sparse JAX, where certain operations can be sparsified, but not all of them. 
And we feel that one is a little bit um, better because we can guarantee that we can map the operations to actually efficient implementation. So uh, you cannot really shoot yourself in the foot. But like you said, like one one makes it simpler on one side and harder on the other side, and one makes it uh, vice versa. So uh, again, we're we're open for this discussion. Right. I think the, another another kind of thing that occurred to me is, I mean, again, I don't have any reference right now. It would be where, let's say, in the input language JAX or or PyTorch, we have one way to do it, and in, in stable HLO, we keep it, let's say, closed world. Then errors in stable HLO have to be communicated properly to the source language, right? Uh, because sometimes you say, well, stable HLO doesn't allow it, but the user doesn't know what that means, right? Yeah, but I assume there's a certain uh, like a protocol on like defining uh, builders from a language to stable HLO. So if you don't have builders for particular operators, mm -hmm. operations, you, you cannot even write the front end. So the, the people writing the front end there will, will not even run into those problems with the closed world one because there's just no builder for sparsity there. But, uh, right, so yeah, so anyway, that's another discussion point. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Art. Uh, I think we can move along now. Um, and again, please check out the RFC uh, and uh, dig in there for further commentary. All right. Okay. So um, next up, we have community news. Um, some updates are that uh, we are looking to create um, or to host an event soon. Uh, can people still hear me? For some reason, my uh, view of attendees uh, disappeared. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So we've decided uh, to help in uh, basically with your help. Um, have a one-day Open XLA Summit, um, and we're hoping to host that the last week in April, so sometime around April 26th and 27th, um, and I uh, just wanted to put that on people's radars. We'll be able to uh, announce more in the next week um, so we can start thinking about um, uh, putting together an RFC, um, and we'll send out also a, a form basically uh, asking what topics you'd be interested in hearing from and potentially if um, any of you would be interested in um, providing presentations of your own. Um, so looking forward to that, um, and we'll uh, share more information in the normal channels. Um, we also have uh, Links here to the two RFCs we discussed today. Um, again, please take a look and comment on the RFCs. Um, for the Stable HLO and TOSA um, arithmetic RFC, um, we mentioned potentially having an ad hoc community meeting um, to uh, discuss that further. Um, please watch that issue because we'll share calendar event details on the issue itself in case um, we decide to, to set that up. Um, James, you had your hand up. Yes, I was. I was waiting for you to end, uh, finish off the RFCs. But uh, the only last thing I wanted to add here, related to community and marketing, is just want to thank folks for sending through the quotes for the blog. We really appreciate it. There's a couple uh, remaining folks uh, who I believe are on the call who, who can uh, send over those quotes by end of day or midweek would be fantastic. Um, just as we're trying to finalize that draft, and then we're going to get. Uh, a staged copy out to all of you. So really appreciate all the back and forth on the quotes and, and just wanted to give a reminder on, on any remaining quotes that uh, you guys can send through. Um, and just to provide some context for that, um, we're excited that we're going to uh, publish a blog post about um, the OpenXLA project. Uh, timing um, to coincide with us uh, opening PRs up in the XLA repository that's migrated under OpenXLA. Um, PRs have been um, 
uh, open in the XLA and TensorFlow, and we're officially uh, transitioning to contributions in Open XLA um, in the beginning of March. Um, and the blog post will go into that a little bit more, as well as talking about welcoming um, the Erie community into the Open XLA project. Um, and one other update, um, as we have five minutes left, uh, is that we have a new roadmap up for uh, Stable HLO. Eugene, did you want to um, talk a little bit about that? Sounds good. Uh, uh, thank you, Thea. Uh, can you uh, uh, go to the next page? All right, great. Um, so we've been very busy working on Stable HLO in the, in the last two quarters. And we made a lot of progress, solidifying the offset, making it compatible with the ecosystem, and implementing compatibility guarantees. And today, I wanted to say a few words about where this is all heading. Uh, so six months uh, since its inception, our repository now has uh, about 500 commits and almost 300 open issues. So that's uh, pretty tricky to keep track of. So we put together a roadmap that I'd like to share with you all. In 2023, we envision two major releases. Uh, 0.9 is planned to happen very soon, within a few weeks. And it will be the initial release to include the key functionality of stable HLO, comprehensive spec and compatibility guarantees. Uh, the uh, current version of the spec covers 94 statically shaped ops. So as discussed today, quantization is not covered yet. And the stable HLO dialect works with TF, JAX, PyTorch, as well as XLA and Erie. We're putting the finishing touches uh, to the implementation of compatibility, and we'll soon be ready to start providing one month of compatibility guarantees. After releasing 0 0.9, uh, we will give the project some time to mature, clean up the implementation, use compatibility in practice while making changes, introduce some more new features. So we discussed quantization and sparsity today uh, in a lot of detail. And then in the second half of 2023, we're planning to release 1.0, providing five years of compatibility, as discussed in the corresponding RFC last year. In 1.0, uh, we're aiming to provide a pristine front-end contract so that stable issue programs consist only of spec offs, as compared to the current situation where these programs can include a mixture of dialects that varies across producers, a read, quant, shape, sparse tensor, regular tensor, et cetera, lots of stuff going on. And uh, this pristine front-end contract where everything's like specced in one place, it's especially important for dynamic programs, for example, where there are many styles to express shape computations that vary across the community. And uh, today, thanks to Eric's presentation, we heard how quantization is also important to provide clarity. Anyway, last but not the least, 1.0 will include the reference implementation of the stable issue spec, so of everything that we will have documented by then. And that's something that we're actively working on right now. Anyway, that's everything that I had. This is going to be an exciting year for Stable HLO uh, with plenty of useful functionality to look forward to. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, and I believe that is the end of our um, presentation today, right on time. Um, a final thank you for our two presenters, um, as well as Eugene, for talking about um, Stable HLO. This community meeting was uh, all Stable HLO all the time. So, <laughs> um, and I'll, again, uh, thank you all for joining after a long weekend in the US um, and look forward to uh, seeing you all again in a month's time on the third Tuesday of March.